Thank you for joining me on the program again this week. God bless you. Like we always uh, encourage ourselves on this program, and it's always taken from the Word of God, the Bible. The Bible says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are a few who find it. I pray by God's grace that if you have not found the narrow way, that you will take time to examine your way this day. Because if you have not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, the truth of the matter is, you are already on your way to hell. So uh, I encourage this, this morning, even as you listen to the sermon, that you know the word of God will mix with faith in your heart, and by God's grace, you will make the right decision. Today's uh, topic is titled Your Salvation as close as your mouth and acts. Your salvation is as close as your mouth and your heart. But before we go into the uh, sermon, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you. We bless you again for this opportunity to preach your word to your people. Lord, I pray as your word is coming out, that your power will rest upon it. For every here that will hear your word, Father Lord, let it do them good in the name of Jesus. And let your name alone be glorified. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. The last time we were on Harvest Feast, uh, we dealt with a topic, human goodness without Christ is a recipe for hell fire. Human goodness without Christ is a recipe for hell fire, hell fire. That's what we did last time. Today, we are going to be uh, examining some of the things we discussed in the last topic. We're going to build on it to really delve into today's topic, your salvation as close to your mouth and your heart. The two topics are kind of linked, but the whole essence is to bring the Word of God to you in a clear and, and concise way so that it makes the meaning that the Holy Spirit is intending for His Word to make in our lives. Amen? Now, today's Bible uh, reading is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 10, and I start from verse 5, and I'll read to 13. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who we are sent into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The world is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, 
and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon his name. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Again, today's topic is salvation is as close as your mouth and heart. That is your salvation if you are yet to receive Jesus Christ in, into your life. I'm saying to you this day that your salvation is as close to you as your mouth and your heart. And just follow me as we continue in this uh, sermon. You will see what the Word of God is saying to you. Now, I'm going to go over a bit of things that we did last time on this program. That is talking about the law. The law. Because I understand that there have been a lot of misunderstandings when people are talking about the law as the law was applied in the Old Testament and how we see the law in New Testament. Now, let me first start by defining what the law is. Let's, let's start from there. The law can be defined as God's ordinances, that is, God's commandments, by which man must live to please God. Ten commandments, we know, they were given to Moses. <clears throat> God wrote and gave to Moses to commemorate his covenant with children of Israel after they pledged that they will obey God. Also, Torah, or five books of Moses, they are also referred to as the law. And also, the whole of Old Testament, Torah, the prophet, etc., the whole of Old Testament, from the New Testament perspective, is referred to as the law as well. Now, we know that because of sinful nature of, nature of human beings, human beings are not able to obey the law of the, of the Lord perfectly. We do not have the ability to obey the law of the Lord. And because of this, the best we can do with our best of intentions will be for the law to expose our weaknesses as human beings. And then through the law, the Bible says, we have the understanding of sin. And when we have that understanding of sin, there's something that happens immediately. We are immediately locked in. The law is not able to do it because it's weak through the flesh, according to the word of God. We are just trapped right there. Regardless of whatever we want to do, we are not able to fulfill the law. But thank God, who sent his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he came and fulfilled the law. That which we cannot do because our flesh is weak, the Lord Jesus did for us. Now, for the purpose of understanding the law, the Bible scholars, they have tried to, you know, categorize the law, you know, into three main, you know, categories, if you will. They call the first one moral law. I mean, this is not in the scripture, but it's a way for us to understand. Remember, we have so many laws apart from the Ten Commandments given to Moses, by which children of Israel must live so that they will please God. They will not sin against God. So these laws, including... Uh, the Ten Commandments have been categorized into three main uh, categories. The first one we call moral law. 
This one is based on God's holy nature. These are referred to as such as ordinances. Because you know God is just, is holy, and God is unchanging. These laws in, in this category, they include ten commandments and others. Obeying these laws surely have great benefits to honor God and also to love one another. And it prevents those who obey from breaking other laws of their society that can land them in jail or even in worse situations. The Ten Commandments are corroborated in the great commandments as given by the Lord Jesus Christ. This is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, from verse 37 to 40. Jesus said to him, that is, answering those people questioning him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments and are the law and the prophets. So that is talking about the ten, I mean the great commandment that we have under moral law. Now also we have a ceremonial law of God, and then we have finally what is referred to as judicial law. Let me talk about the ceremonial law because I believe we know what that literally uh, translates to. There are customs that things that focus, you know, on the you know the 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 cultural situation of, of, of children of Israel, what they were used to, these laws had to do with talking about the ceremonial law had to do with obeying God and pleasing God based on you know the instructions that God gave them. And those instructions essentially they they representing uh, they, they, they were representing things God put in place so that the children of Israel would not wander out from him. Uh, those ceremonial law, we know them, they include all these, uh, you know, uh, sacrifices that they have to do, uh, you know, festivals they have to observe, and, you know, and so many other things like that. We call them ceremonial laws. And those ones, we know, like, we say these days that thank God Jesus has come, faith has come to us, and we know the Bible says we are no longer bound to those laws. We are no longer expected to go out, be doing, you know, the sacrifices of bulls, rams, goats, and things like that. Thank God for that. And the Bible says why we need to be, you know, so careful so that we don't misconstrue the fact that we are not bound to those laws, we do not want to misunderstand that for the fact that we are expected to be children of God who hate evil, but love to do according to the instructions of the word of God. Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 5, he was talking to those people he was teaching them from verse 17 to 18. Hear what Jesus said. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For I surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one judge or one teacher will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. You see, this what is telling us is we are never to discountenance the word of God. The Bible is true. Why we may say we are in New Testament period that we are no longer bound to the law, it's not the law itself that has changed. The law is still the law. What has changed is the Lord Jesus Christ has come and he has fulfilled the law on our behalf. So we are no longer bound to that fulfillment anymore. 
So the life that we live now is in Christ Jesus, and we have to live a holy life unto him. The Bible says, be ye holy, because your God is holy. So, I hear people say all these things that, uh, you know, uh, this is New Testament, this and this, uh, Sabbath, we don't need to observe Sabbath, thank God. Jesus is our new Sabbath. We know we have rest in him. But the truth of the matter is, we need to honor God with our time. We need to spend quality time. Separate a day as you deem fit to have time to study the word, be in the presence of God, be renewed in your spirit. All these things are very important. And we don't want to lose sight of that in Jesus' name. Amen? So, the third one is called judicial civil law, of course. This includes all the laws, including moral and things like that, except the Ten Commandments not included in the third category. These laws were based on Israelites' place and culture. Now, we know we want to have the understanding of the Word of God, and we don't want to misplace things even as we want to understand what the Lord is saying to us. But I have a little illustration here, how we need to understand why the law at its best will only show us how weak we are. It will only show us our inability to really fulfill the commandment of God. Let me give you this illustration. Imagine parents and their little ones. Let's look at parents and their little ones as an example. Parents will instruct their kids about do's and don'ts because they believe those kids have to listen to them when they tell them what to do. And the moment they have given those do's and don'ts to the children, parents automatically expect those children to begin to think about what they have been given and then the instructions they received, we expect them to carry those instructions out. But the moment those kids have received that and they don't do accordingly, we will tell them, now you are in trouble because I told you to do this, you did not do it. I told you to do that, you failed to do it. Now we will tell all our children who have not done what we asked them to do. We tell them you have disobeyed. Let me ask you, what do you think has changed? The only thing that has changed is because we have set the rules. We have told them what they can do and what they cannot do. And with that, they are now held accountable. The same thing is for the law. The Bible says that God gave the law because of transgressions. Because God wanted children of Israel to do what? To focus on him. And if they were not guided, then there will be serious issues. So God did that so that their attention would be on God. And their excesses, if you will, will be curtailed. So that's the whole essence of what the law is serving. We discussed this in our last uh, uh, sermon as well. See what the uh, Bible says in Romans 7.7. 7. See, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. That's from Romans chapter 7, verse 7. So, like I said, like I said earlier on, the best that can happen is for us to understand our weakness through the law. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for the law is the knowledge of sin. Amen? In other words, the law was given to point us to the fact that we need a savior for the law was inadequate in itself to deliver but sad to show our helplessness without a savior for with the law came 
the knowledge of sin. Amen. And I hope we, we are just following the way we are going. I'm giving this background because we need to know that the only hope we have in this life is Jesus. It's not our goodness. It's not what we are able to do. It's not our education. It's not our social cycle. It's not what we have been used to or the wealth we have or whatever you may want to say. That's not what is going to save us. And it's got nothing to do with our skin color as well. It's got nothing to do with, uh, you know, whatever you may say you are being exposed to in life. But the only exposure that you need to have in life is to be exposed to the Word of God. Because the Word of God is life. And the Word of God is Jesus himself, the Bible says. And we need to know that that is the only thing that can save us, the word of God. Amen? So that's why we are giving background as regards the law. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, it says, For Christ is the hand of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is the hand of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Amen? Now, so to all you Christians who are out here, I'm talking about those people who are born of the Spirit, who have been given wrong doctrines. Some people have told you that you do not even know whether you are saved or not. They will tell you you don't even know whether you will make heaven. Unfortunately, there's nothing like that in the Bible. The Bible says, if you give your life to Jesus, you are given the gift of the Holy Spirit and you are saved. That's what the word of God says. So I don't know where people get that doctrine. And what I see people do in that wise is actually teaching a false religion. That's not in the Bible. It's a false religion. And what they do not understand is they are diminishing what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. He gave his life for our own life. The Bible says he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we can become the righteousness of God through him. So how much effort do you think you can make to give your life? Jesus did it all. So I've had it from some people. They will say, well, you don't even know whether you're going to make it to heaven. Well, if you're a child of God, born of the Spirit, you're already on your way to heaven. So what is important is the work you do here so that you can have reward in heaven. Salvation through faith. The results you have by giving your life to Jesus is you make heaven, having faith in Jesus Christ. But that does not translate to rewards in heaven. The good works that you have been sent to do here, if you do them diligently, the rewards are awaiting you in heaven, the Bible says. So we need to understand those two things and we don't want to in any way confuse them. Let's understand what the Word of God is saying to us. From this passage, I'm going to bring uh, about four more things to light, especially for those people who are hearing me and they have not given their lives to Jesus. The saving grace of God through Jesus Christ is available to all for the asking. Salvation is available to everyone who will freely come to God through Jesus by simply acknowledging Jesus as Savior and have the conviction that he, resurrected, that he resurrected from the dead for all who will believe in him to live again. Whoever believes in their hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead to save mankind from eternal damnation will have righteousness through Jesus Christ. And whoever confesses Jesus as Lord will be saved. That's what the passage is saying. And it's also saying, coming to Jesus removes the shame of sin and death and even hell, regardless of one's background, race, color, creed. You can see the word of God, salvation, has given equal opportunity to everyone. Amen? So, how do the things revealed from this uh, Bible passage, how do they apply to people especially those people who are here to give their lives to Jesus. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, from verse 24 to 26, 
There's no, uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously, previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be, he might be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So there's no reason to deny the love of God that is demonstrated in Christ Jesus, who suffered and died for the sins of the world. He resurrected and he ascended on high. And he's coming back. He's currently seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. The Bible says, but guess what? He's coming back for his church. So we don't have any reason. You do not have any reason today if you are under uh, uh, the sound of my voice. You do not have any reason today to say, well, you don't even understand what is meant by salvation. It has been preached to you. The word of God has been preached to you. And I pray you will open your ears today so that the word that you hear hearing will mix with faith in your heart and you will release your life to Jesus Christ. The work of salvation was finished by Jesus once and for all. And what is required to receive it is faith in Jesus alone. For this was pleasing to the Father. This is taken from uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9 to verse 10. He reads this way. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. This is Jesus talking. Oh God, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Remember I was talking about the sacrifices and everything that were offered for sins and everything in the, in the times of the Old Testament? None of those things, the Bible says, the book of Hebrews says, could save anybody. The, sin, the, the blood of bull, all those things, they only sat as cover up. The sins were covered so that the wrath of God would not come upon people. But God already had his plan. The plan he had was in his seed, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came, when he was revealed, faith came to mankind. Before Jesus came, we couldn't have had anything we could have faith in that would serve as go between, between us and God Almighty. The sinful nature of human beings cannot make human beings to stand before God. There has to be a goal between. Jesus Christ did that for us. And he's the only one that lived the perfect life. He's the only one that lived the perfect life. None of the goats, none of the rams, none of the booms, uh, uh, the bulls that were offered in the times of Old Testament, none of those things had the ability to save a single soul. All of those things killed, sacrificed, they could not save even a single soul because we could not have, they could not have faith in them. But when Jesus came, faith came. Hallelujah. Everything changed. Glory to God. Believing in the heart that Jesus did not remain in that grave is the key that unlocks the door of God's grace to flow into a life and inputs righteousness of Jesus. Why? Confessing Jesus as Lord is the public declaration of allegiance to Jesus because he publicly took our shame upon himself. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Amen. Jesus took the pains and shame of sin and nailed them to the cross. He conquered the power of death by rising up from the dead. And his finished work of salvation is for all who will believe in him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, 
that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Not, not this, not this. People need to realize this. That I've said it before, but I want to say it again. That Jesus did not come to remove the righteousness that can be found in obeying the law. That's not why Jesus came. He came to fulfill that righteousness. And that is what Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians in Rome. I mean, to the Christians, I mean, in Rome. In Romans chapter 10, verse 4. For Christ is the hand of law for righteousness to everyone who believes. I think that is straight and simple. But I, I don't understand why we try to confuse it with other things. I will say it again. Jesus did not come to remove the righteousness that can be found in obeying the law. He came to fulfill that righteousness. That's all Jesus did for us. Because we, being with through the flesh, we could not and we cannot fulfill the law of God. Jesus came and did, for, did that for us. Amen. The Bible says, I said this again in Matthew chapter 5, 17. Jesus said, he did not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but he came to fulfill them. I've said that before, and I want us to always remember that the law, the word of God, is always the word of God. The Bible says the word of God is good for us at all times. For rebuke, correction in righteousness is good for us. For teaching is good for us. The Bible says for, for the man of God to be made complete, for us to live a holy life, we need the word of God. And all the law that we receive, apart from those ones that have to do with rituals, killings and things like that, of, you know, for sacrifices and things like that, those are the ones that we can see physically are no longer required. Nowadays, they're no longer required. And we know that indeed we do not need them now because Jesus has been and he is the perfect sacrifice for our sin. So we don't need all those things anymore. But when you talk about the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments are for all times. God has given those laws for us to live a holy life unto him. And Jesus himself warned that whoever, whoever tries to change things like that by trying to manipulate the word of God, the cause will, call, will come upon such a person. And you don't want to be cursed because we need to understand what the word of God is saying and then we should stop twisting the word of God. I've listened to so many pastors. They will say, oh, you know, because we are under grace now. We, can, we, can, we, don't, we, don't, we are not bound. We, to this anymore. We are not bound to that anymore because Jesus has released us from the, from the bondage of sin. Glory be to God. He has done that. What Jesus has done is he has fulfilled that which we could not do. And we have to live our lives now through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in all honesty, that brings us to a situation whereby our responsibility, even our our, our seriousness towards obeying the law has to be on a higher level. It has to be because the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is expected. That's what the word of God says. We need to know that we have higher responsibility, even under the dispensation of grace. Because God has gone to that extent to make things, to make life easier for us by coming in the person of Jesus Christ to mankind. And he, he, he released himself to be humiliated, to be killed. Thank God he rose on the third day and he ascended on high and he's coming back. But the truth of the matter is what Jesus Christ did for us gives us a way to think that we have our responsibility, even under the dispensation of grace. Amen. And I will, I will, go, I will read the Romans chapter 8. From verse 2 to 4, because I want to really let people see what's important when they're talking about the law and then the dispensation of grace that we have. I want them to understand what the Bible is saying. The Bible says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Did you hear that? For the law of the Spirit of life, we now live our life according to the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ. It's a whole different ball game. 
So we don't want to confuse things at all. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Amen. So it's so it is crystal clear. I don't know why people try to twist this Bible passage. What the Bible is saying is in ourselves, we do not have the ability to fulfill the law. God, in his infinite mercy, sent his only begotten son. He did that for us. Now, we don't live under the bands, under the, the constraint of the law anymore, because Jesus already fulfilled the requirements of the law. Now, we are subject to live under the spiritual law of life in Jesus Christ. That is, we need to live our lives to obey the word of God. That is what the Bible is saying. That is what the Bible is saying. The dispensation of grace is a dispensation that, 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 that requires us to, 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 to take things more seriously because God has gone to the farthest extent to meet our needs. The greatest need the mankind ever had has always been salvation and God provided for that through the blood of his only begotten son. So in conclusion, I'm not saying, or I'm not in any way opposed to high sense of morality or great character, for the Bible does not teach us that we should oppose to that. All we are saying is those things, they cannot save you. I've said that before. When Jesus was talking to them in Matthew chapter 5, he told them, I did not come to destroy the law. But I came to even establish it. How did he establish it? He established it by fulfilling the law himself. We have to know that Christ did what, what Christ did on the cross was once and for all. And there's no need for any excuse for those who are here to come to him. For all those Christians out there, I'm talking to those people who have been born of the Spirit. Please, always read your Bible with understanding. Jesus Christ has done it for you once and for all. It's not going to happen through your effort anymore. I'm not saying you should not live your daily life obeying him. That's not what I'm saying. But it's not going to come from the works of flesh. No. It is the Spirit of God who lives in you that will help you to live a life that is fulfilling as a child of God. And the Bible says you do not have the fear of sin anymore if you know you are born again. There's no fear of death or hell anymore. That has to be something we are grateful for, even as children of God. And if you are here to know Jesus, you can, you can come into the camp today so that you become grateful for the same reason. We believe by now, we should know that there is nothing that is good in any person. I believe by now, with all we've been saying, and I want, I want to know that you believe by now. There's nothing in anybody that is capable of saving them. There's no goodness. There's nothing. And the same way, we can say there's no bad person living today that cannot be saved. Because we believe it's not what they're going to do that will save them. But the decision they make, it's not the ability that will save them. But the decision to make, the decision they make for Christ is what is capable of saving anybody. Hallelujah. We all need to come under the blood of Jesus to receive justification and be reconciled to God. So in the final analysis, I can now conclude by saying the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. I'll say it again. The heart of the matter that is, the cross of the matter, what is important that we need to know is the matter of the heart of people, if I can say it that way. If your heart is right, you receive the, the word of God and it's mixed with faith in your heart. The Holy Spirit is beckoning to you. Come on. Come on. Don't stay in that wilderness too long, lest you be destroyed. Come on. My hands are 
stretch out to receive you. I challenge you today, you are listening to me, that you consider your way and you come back home. And I've said this before, I want you to hear me out. As terrible as sins are, sins themselves, they are not capable of taking somebody to hell. No. It is your decision to go with sins that will take you to hell. If you decide against sin, then sin have, sins have no hold on you. The Bible says. Because the Bible says, to whom you give your allegiance, to that person you become a slave. If you decide to go with sin, you become the slave of sin. And the result thereof is death. When I say death, I'm not talking about physical death alone. I'm talking about eternal death, that is, separation from God for all of eternity. You don't want to live like that. You don't want to live like that. The Bible says, quoting from Romans chapter 10, from verse 9 to 13, that if you confess the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. That's the word of God. For with your heart you believe, on, you believe unto righteousness, and with your mouth you make confess, confession unto salvation. It's, talking, it's still talking about the issue of your heart. If your right heart is right, you believe unto righteousness, and you confess it with your mouth. You confess the word of salvation. Amen? For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will never be put to shame. That is the word of God. Whoever believes the word of God, that Jesus is the Lord, and he came, he gave his life, he lived a sinless life, he was crucified, he died, he bled to death, and he rose on the third day for our salvation. If you believe that, let me tell you, it may sound so simple, but what Jesus did for us wasn't anything simple at all. But guess what? It's for you for the taking. If you believe, that's what the word of God says. The Bible says there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. That is, everybody is on the level ground, level plane. For the same Lord over all is rich towards all that will call upon his name. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I said, and I challenge you, that your salvation is as close to you as what? As your heart and your mouth. You have no excuse. You have no excuse. The Bible says in that passage of the, of the Bible, uh, Romans chapter 10, I think verse 5 to 7 and 8, it's telling us that you don't want to say, Jesus has not come. Who is going to get him from heaven? He's, he already come and he has returned and he's coming back. He has done what he has to do. Now, the ball is in your court. And I pray you make the right decision today in Jesus' name. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14, that the backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways. People who don't want to listen to the word of God, they will come up with all sorts of excuses. Some of them even have all these uh, uh, philosophical sayings. They have read some books. They begin to bring, put things together. And those things will sound very nice to hear. And then they begin to deceive themselves. Let me be honest with you. The word of God is true. Jesus said, I hand away the truth and the life. No, birth, no one coming to the Father except by me. So Jesus himself said that. And the Father said in that Bible passage that me and my Father, we are one. So if you know Jesus, you will have peace with God. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Finally, the Bible says in Acts 4, chapter 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I challenge you this morning, if you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please come back home and make the right decision. And as you do that, you see the difference in your life. If you have decided to do that this morning, as I will uh, pray now in finishing a link will come on the screen if you click on that link it will take you to a website I mean to a web page right, that we have prepared especially for you we took our time to do this 
And the whole idea is you see the steps of salvation. You see what it, what, what, what it means to be a child of God. And you commit your life to Jesus right there. And then you follow all those things. If you have any questions, I mean, we have uh, we've made uh, some, uh, some room for you to be able to contact us so that we can be of help. And as you do that, God will bless you richly. Thank you, everyone, for listening to me. And I know the word has come out, and it will do you good today in Jesus' name. Shall we pray? Amen. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word that you have released to us. Thank you for the lives that you have touched. Lord, we pray that your word will do us good every day of our lives. And Lord, we pray you keep us safe, even in knowing you more every day, until we come back on this program. Thank you, our Lord and our Savior. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. And thank you for those lives, again, that you have touched today. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. And I hope to see you again on this program very soon in Jesus' name. But until then, remain blessed.